All right, so um, welcome everyone. We will be reviewing sprints 84 and 85 today. Uh, we are going to start out with a couple of um, team changes. So um, the core platform team has three new members, um, Craig Hongwei and Mikhail. They're actually not new to the project, but um, a new to core platform um, for Q2. Um, this is part of supporting our Q2 priorities and um, platform and performance are um, one of our top priorities for Q2. So we wanted to make sure that the core platform team had enough firepower um, to get us, to keep us moving um, on those tracks. Um, we also have another new team, uh, the Performance Task Force. Um, and again, these folks are not um, new to Folio. Um, they've uh, joined from other teams. Um, and their goal will be to um, create a performance environment, a performance testing framework, and execute performance tests. Um, so again, um, very much in support of our performance um, per, uh, priority for Q2. We have a new developer on the UNAM team. Um, this is Christian. Welcome, Christian. And then finally, we have another new team here at the end. Um, There we are, Firebird. Okay, so Firebird is um, Firebird is working on the quick mark uh, feature, which will allow you to um, edit uh, mark records from within inventory. Um, these guys are also not entirely new to Folio. Most of them have been working on other teams um, while they ramp up. Um, Stephanie Buck is the product owner for this team. And they just got started, so they're not um, quite ready to demo anything this time. But um, I would expect that next time around, we'll get to see some of what they've been working on. So excited to have this team going. All right, so I wasn't sure if Jakob was going to be able to join. Jakob, did you? Are you here? I guess he's not. His, um, his son is sick, so um, he asked me to present his slides if he wasn't able to make it. So I will do that. So this is the um, release timeline slide. Um, as you saw on the timeline, the 6th of April, that's yesterday, um, was the bug fix releases deadline. And we're past that. And we do still have some open and in progress and in review issues that are release blockers. These are indicated by the tag Q1 2020 bug fix. Um, and these do need to be fixed before the release can go out. Um, there is a release triage group that is meeting every day to review these issues. We're consulting with POs um, to determine are these really messed um, and what's the status. And so some of these issues may, so may decide issues. That, um, that they are not must fix. Maybe they can come out in, as a hot fix um, after the release, for example. So we're still making our way through these issues. Um, you know, looking at them daily. Uh, so we're not, we're not a go on the release yet, but um, we haven't given up on um, the idea of releasing on Friday the 10th. Uh, sorry, actually, I think the 10th is Monday. Um, okay, so um, the other thing I should note here is that um, there were a number of um, automatic module migration issues that were discovered um, while setting up Bugfest, and a lot of those have been fixed. Um, so thank you to the teams who turned those around so quickly. Um, but um, the release triage group looked at the remaining open migration issues and decided that um, they do not need to be release blockers. So for those, we have changed the labels um, from Q1 2020 bug fix to Q1 2020 hot fix. So this means that we do want to get these out um, as soon as possible, but they do not need to hold up, hold up the release. Um, so that, I think there were just three of those. Uh, so hotfix releases um, for Flower. this is really basically just the same as what we did for Edelweiss. Um, we will support hotfixes and um, the label we'll use for them is Q1 2020 hotfix. Um, 
And uh, Jakob says, release maintainers are requested to sec fix version with both Q1 hotfix and Q2, um, if any version numbers before closing the ticket. So if you have any questions on this, um, reach out to Jakob. And then we do also have a um, goldenrod release timeline put together here, which you can review. Um, just a note on those priorities I mentioned earlier on, um, in addition to platform and quality, which is really one of our top priorities for Q2, we're also really focused on the round two implementers needs. Um, there's a link in this slide to the wiki page that has the features that are important for this cohort. cohort. There's a, a three to five um, institutions that want to go live this summer, and um, they need things like QuickMark. Um, and import and export. So we really need to make sure we get these, um, these features in place for them. Um, and then of course we've got um, other important MVP features that we're working through. Um, so work there hasn't stopped either, but we have, as you saw earlier, we have made some team changes um, to redirect folks um, so that they're focused on things like um, quality performance and also on the round two implementers needs. And we don't usually go through the sprint highlight slides because most of this is covered in the demos, um, but Jakob did ask that I call out this last bullet here. Um, there's a link here to Craig McNally's guide on testing migration scripts locally. I don't know if Craig is on and if he has anything he wants to say about that. Yeah, um, so I, I just created um, this wiki page um, to sort of in hopes that it would help teams uh, with developing and troubleshooting their migration scripts. I know that um, teams that I've worked on, uh, we've run into several issues and it was helpful for me, at least to, to be able to do that without uh, having a full blown folio environment with Okapi and, and all the other modules that are needed. So uh, take a look if you're working on migration scripts, it might be helpful. Awesome, thank you, Craig. All right, um, so with that, I think we can move on to the demos. We do have sprint highlight slides for all the teams. <clears throat> and there are a lot of teams. Okay, so uh, looks like Thunderjet is up first with Dennis kicking off. Great, very stop exciting. sharing here. Um, and I'm just gonna mention, Essentially that, yeah, we, we, we've done a lot of work in the last four weeks. A fair bit of that was focused on stability and bug fixes, obviously. Today, Andre is going to demo some updates made to receiving that primarily address receiving packages, receiving multiple pieces at once, and navigating between records uh, during the receiving workflow. So getting some information from orders and being able to get back to orders quickly and so on. After that, we'll show some exciting stuff that's been done on generating payments and credits against funds based on approving and paying invoices. So part of completing that workflow for acquisitions where you can actually process an invoice and have those uh, amounts associated with that invoice debit your funds um, so you can actually complete payments. With that, I'll hand things over to Andre. Hopefully he's ready to share his screen. Yeah, okay, hello all. Uh, let me share my screen. I believe you can see it. Yes. Yeah, cool. Uh, today I'm going to present uh, some new useful features in receiving and finance apps. Uh, so let's start uh, from receiving and uh, now we in orders app. I prepared uh, purchase order with the purchase order line and uh, the status of our order is open so we can uh, uh, receive uh, some items. Let's go to PO line details and uh, select uh, receive. So here we can see title that is connected to our order. Let's click on it and see details. Uh, uh, we can see details and uh, there are, that consists of uh, next blocks, it's uh, a title itself and it's a hyperlink to inventory. Uh, then uh, title information, 
and uh, PLI in details. And here we can see PLI number and it's uh, a hyperlink uh, to line as well. And uh, one more thing that I want to pay your attention is item status. Uh, so let's see, receiving list. And the item status is uh, in process for all items. So let's uh, navigate back to our order on the line. Then uh, we go to purchase order. And uh, let's close it. Select uh, reason and submit it. So we see that uh, the workflow status was changed to closed. Let's go back to receiving. And here we can see new information. It's a warning banner with information that uh, purchase order that's connected uh, to the title is closed. And we can see the reason, it's custom user's reason. And uh, if we navigate to receiving list, uh, we'll see that item status was changed for all items. And now it's uh, order closed. The same uh, if we Navigate to uh, inventory, see this item status uh, was successfully changed uh, to or closed. I think that it for receiving and uh, the next part of uh, my part of uh, the demo is related to deleting budgets. So we need to go to finance app. Let's select fund. Uh, the main thing um, is uh, that uh, user can delete uh, budget only if uh, there are no transaction for these budgets in this budget budget and um, budget allocation is equal zero during creation. Uh, let me show how it's work. Let's click create new budget. Let's allocate zero dollars, save. And uh, from the budget details view, we can click action and try to delete it. So the budget was successfully deleted. And uh, one more, if we allocate more than zero and try to do the same, so we'll see that budget cannot be deleted because it has transaction. We know that uh, the first uh, transaction was uh, allocation, our $1 when we created this budget. I think that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Cool. Thank you, that looks good. It's it's good to know that you guys have added this new status because I think there's some follow on work we need to do to define what should happen when it's checked out or requested and yeah, sure there's uh, a filter added and so on. And I'll just mention while we're transitioning to the next part of the demo here that uh, even though an order, even though the item status is order closed, uh, those, those things could still be received and put into in process. Um, but if they aren't received, presumably they can be deleted now that there's no, uh, previously there was a restriction on deleting items that were on order. So this might be a way around that it was kind of part of the thinking as well. Good to know, thank you. Okay, I think I can start. Uh, basically, I have, uh, couple things to show. Uh, first of all, uh, I wanted to mention that we finished refactoring of our lists in acquisition applications like orders, invoices, organizations, finance uh, to switch off search and sort. It actually gives us uh, granularity of uh, like uh, functions uh, to display filters what we want uh, to like uh, use uh, to not override search and sort logic, but use our own uh, basically. Uh, and regarding UI orders, uh, what was done in, in, in uh, 
last couple of weeks. Uh, the main outcome uh, is that uh, we were able. Oh, sorry, sorry, let me move. The main outcome was uh, that we were able to turn on uh, tests of big test, uh, and uh, they green again. They green. Um, so. As you can see, uh, coverage uh, was turned off for uh, some time, and uh, I hope that uh, for now, uh, actually refactoring helps uh, and uh, timeouts. Uh, we still experience them, but they just uh, uh, like uh, more rare. Um, so still keep an eye on improvements for big test. Uh, regarding other things, um, so here we are in the purchase order. Uh, I've prepared a order uh, with one purchase order line and uh, it's total estimated price like uh, 9.99. Um, so uh, what I wanted to show is that uh, now we connected orders, invoices, and uh, finance app. Uh, so we have order; it's opened. Uh, we can uh, I, I created a test invoice uh, with uh, appropriate order line, and uh, we have uh, that amount in invoice. And uh, uh, earlier we showed how to approve and pay such invoices. So voucher created, and uh, actually we can go to that uh, budget that we used in push the line. It's uh, our fund was Canadian history. So we can just go to the finance uh, Canadian history fund. Uh, we have current budget. Uh, here we have transaction list and uh, here we have all uh, the history of uh, like movement, money movement. Uh, we have location, encumbrance when order was created and opened, and we have payment from voucher. Uh, so mm, yeah, that was uh, done recently. Mm, and uh, the last thing. Uh, it's uh, like a sneak peek to the invoices. Uh, we have vouchers and we have uh, export. Uh, we have to uh, export them. So uh, we can go to, we created page groups that actually we should be able to assign to the invoice and uh, uh, correspond to the voucher. And uh, we have configuration of exports. So it's pair batch group, we showed earlier, and uh, uh, we have a couple uh, methods, uh, like uh, scheduling is under active development. Here we have uh, started, uh, and I can show you progress on manual export. So basically we have a list of exports here uh, and uh, actually, when I click run, we have uh, just a um, confirmation window that all vouchers created since last export uh, for this particular batch group will be exported. Uh, and if I click continue, backend creates appropriate records. Uh, and uh, here we are. Uh, so uh, the next step will be able to download uh, that uh, batch uh, voucher. So yeah, I think that's it. Uh, thanks. That looks great. Thank you. It's amazing how much, how sort of deep the functionality is in acquisitions these days. Looks great. Okay, FullyJet is up next and Anne-Marie was gonna kick it off. Yes, so um, like Dennis said, in over in FullyJet, we've been um, 
we've had a hectic last couple sprints, the last couple weeks, especially with the bug testing and the bug fixing and priority shifting every couple of days. Um, but we're going to have two um, demos. The first is from Taras Tachenko about the field mapping profiles. Um, so the field mapping profiles that are going to be used in import is a combination of data that comes from incoming records like a certain field in the MARC record, um, along with constant data or default data that's needed to uh, create the folio record, um, along with some syntax uh, to make sure that all of that makes sense, whether I'm uh, looking for a MARC field and subfield to grab data from, or whether I'm putting in certain uh, default data or putting in some sort of a cascade. So that's what Taras is gonna show. I hope. Taras? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, okay, can you share screen? Yeah, sure. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes, Kadeshi, Kadeshi. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, as you can see, we have uh, a list of mapping profiles here. So um, now we have implemented um, mapping profile with details only for uh, three uh, entities in the inventory. It is inventory items, inventory holdings, and inventory instances. So um, now all, all of those uh, profiles have uh, empty details sections because when we started this, uh, we haven't uh, a decent information on uh, what should be in, in this in those detail sections, what should be rules and so on. How, uh, so we can like um, uh, take any uh, record and edit it. Uh, it will be equal to creating a new record actually. So as you can see, um, we have uh, a form that uh, much resembles the same form in the inventory. Uh, now it is holdings. Um, aside uh, from, uh, we have no field decorators with uh, default values, uh, Boolean actions for checkboxes, and mapping actions for repeatable fields. However, it just resembles the original form, but uh, with the different field names and thus uh, the different data inside. So we can um, create uh, some data uh, and uh, that uh, like fill in this one uh, and save it. So now we have details in it in this. Um, in this form, and uh, you, as you can see, it is render. It renders like uh, multi-column list uh, now. However, it is optional uh, thing if you don't want to um, render those details for repeatable fields as MCL list. Uh, you can set any other set of components, and it will render as you like. I will uh, show you again. Uh, the match profiles as a, an example of custom rendering. So um, we can edit the form again uh, and uh, we can also change uh, existing record folio, existing record type here and uh, see that uh, uh, section, uh, detail section for this profile will change and uh, initial data will uh, wipe out the previous data we um, enter into the uh, form redux state uh, and we can like create um, a data for another type of uh, existing record. Uh, we can switch it to instance and so on and uh, we can return it back to holdings and we can see that data is back. So it uh, remembers our previous record and take it from Redux uh, state to, to fill it in back. 
um, all of our, can you see a screen now? Yes. Yes, so uh, all of our fields uh, inside this detail section uh, has initial data configs. Uh, so uh, as you can see, um, uh, there are holding statements for supplement, supplements uh, repeatable field config here. So we can see a field itself and its subfields or columns. Uh, that uh, config uh, is used to reload the data and um, substitute, initial, uh, substitute the old data or empty section with initials. So it is all configurable. Uh, it, config, it, it is rendered using our um, flexible form that I have uh, shown you uh, the, in the previous demo. Um, for match profiles, it, it is a, a also renders like uh, using this flexible form declarative form uh, renderer. So as you can see, uh, match criteria is whole uh, big uh, row of uh, a repeatable field and it, it is not a multi-column list, it is custom. So um, now we can, as, as I have said, uh, we can create uh, any type of um, uh, records uh, for three data types, uh, for items, holdings and instances. So, um, uh, there will be more in the future and uh, you will see the uh, field decorators uh, in the one of the next sprint reviews, I guess. So uh, I think that's all from my side. If you have any questions, please ask. Thanks, Taras. And like he said, we the piece that we haven't finished that we are uh, rushing to finish is making it so that you can map appropriately when you are dealing with repeatable fields, with um, date pickers, with checkboxes, and with the drop-down lists for the reference data. So those are the last pieces that we need to do to make those um, inventory mapping profiles fully functional. So Alexi is going to be next and we're going to kind of tag team here. Um, what Alexi is going to show is definitely still a work in progress, um, uh, but it's a product of all of the work that the whole team's been doing, getting all the profile types ready, um, switching over from, um, from the previous way of interacting with inventory to PubSub in this quarter, um, creating and implementing the field mapping syntax that can be used in the UI and interpreted properly in by the back end. So Alexi, if you could open up the that mark file just so we could take a, a look at the um, like a, a human readable version of it real quick. So we wanted to show you the whole process end to end um, for imp for creating the job profile that has a match and actions, um, but and then importing the file and showing how it, it creates the instance holding an item according to the mappings. But there's still a couple bugs that are preventing that. We're gonna work on those in the sprint, hopefully show you the whole thing working beautifully at the next sprint demo. So this is a really standard file that somebody might be trying to import. And at the bottom of it, especially, usually in the 9xx fields, there's data that may be um, being used to create um, other types of records. So the 980 there has basically everything you would need to create an order and an invoice. Um, the 949 has a barcode number, so you could use that to create on the item record. And so in order to be able to grab that information and use it, the field mapping profiles have to help you know that go look in the 949 subfield A for this particular file, and that's where you're going to find the barcode number to plunk into the barcode field of the item record. So um, Alexi's going to take over, show you the uh, job profile that we created for the demo and the matches and the actions that go with it. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So um, as Anne-Marie uh, said before, the work in progress, but uh, the main goal uh, is uh, uh, for us is done. We uh, 
finish our interaction integration uh, inventory with uh, PubSub uh, and uh, our source record manager to import um, instances, holdings, and items using uh, profiles and uh, not just only um, um, default uh, default rules for uh, instance creation. Yeah, so um, we prepare a um, um, job profile that uh, contains a next flow. Uh, it, um, it contains a match profile that uh, sh should uh, react, uh, that should try to find an um, instance. And if it uh, doesn't find it in uh, inventory, it should uh, process uh, three actions, uh, create instance, uh, create holding, and uh, create item in this order. Yeah? Uh, so if we look on uh, our action profiles, um, up in demo, yeah. Yeah, uh, we see that it's just a simple uh, uh, profile that uh, contains uh, action uh, to do. In this case, it's a create action and uh, a follow record type. Uh, so it means that we need to create an instance in inventory. And also uh, to this um, action profile, um, uh, this section profile have uh, uh, relations with mapping profile and uh, it, it uh, contains some information. Uh, for now, uh, we doesn't have a decorators for drop down list, so we put um, mm, uh, static IDs for some values. Uh, also, mm, more interesting profile is for item, yeah. Uh, it um, uh, our uh, data import processing core library uh, uh, support this uh, syntaxes that allow us to um, find uh, some uh, value in mark record uh, and um, uh, can cut these values in uh, in one uh, value. But if uh, the first uh, statement will be empty, it try to uh, um, process the second statement. Mm. This is the really cool part to me. So right now, this is set up. If, if I've done a custom call number in the 090, put that in there. Otherwise, drop back to the 050. We could also add an otherwise put in a constant data of needs call number. Um, so, so a nifty piece of the syntax. Yeah. Thank you, Marie. Uh, so uh, for uh, using uh, our PubSub approach and profiles, uh, with uh, in that import application, uh, we can just upload a mark file, and we see uh, all uh, job profiles that are related to uh, mark format. We uh, choose our uh, demo job profile, and uh, before we have only one option to load instances. It's a, a load mark bib records button, and uh, it just create a, a inventory instances with default uh, mapper, uh, mapping rules. Uh, but, for use, uh, but for using the um, job profiles, uh, we can select it and uh, push a run button. And in this case, it should uh, process uh, with uh, PubSub uh, module and uh, create uh, uh, inventory instances and uh, try to match uh, and if there are no match create inventory instances as we see um, we have um, created uh, uh, source records all previous uh, human readable id stuff also applies here so uh, newly created um, source record contains a um, human readable id from uh, inventory. It's assigned to O1 uh, tag, uh, and previous value from O1 field is moved to O35 field, and also uh, a record contains uh, mm, 999 fields uh, with uh, ID, UIDs of uh, source records uh, and uh, of inventory instance. So if we try to uh, get yeah, a share ID for 
Uh, oh. Is <laughs> okay. Uh, of uh, inventory instance and make search. Uh, we can see that uh, this uh, instance created and we can see a source. Uh, and uh, some fields is uh, uh, field by uh, field from mapping profile. It's uh, like a cataloged date as we can see it in our uh, mapping profile. Mm -hmm. Field map and profile instances. Uh, two, two, two. Yeah, we have a value uh, uh, for this field is uh, 2020 and it's presented in uh, uh, created inventory instances and it applies all uh, uh, other stuff like motor efficiency is also loaded from uh, um, uh, this uh, mapping profiles rules. Uh, but unfortunately, I can show um, uh, created uh, created holdings and items because we have some uh, small bugs and I, I hope in uh, the next uh, system demo we present uh, all whole this process. Yeah, but it's, uh, I think, a uh, uh, very good um, uh, thing that uh, we can use uh, our uh, profile structure and uh, all, it, all the stuff int interacts with our PubSub model. So, yep. that's so, it for me. So that's where we broke. We thought we were going to be able to create the holdings and items today, and we couldn't quite do it. So next uh, sprint demo, we're we're intending to have the four decorator pieces done for the field mappings and to be able to show you all, f all three record types being created properly. And then we will have done everything we we're supposed to do for Q1. Okay, thank you. All right, that's it for us, Kate. Wait, did we lose Kate? Can you guys hear me? There you are. Ah, okay. Um, all right, great, thanks, nice work. Um, uh, next up is uh, Spitfire with Kalila. Hey everybody, hope everybody is uh, safe and, and well. Um, so um, I'm gonna just kick off things for, for Spitfire. So for the past two sprints, uh, we've done a lot of work in figuring out how to manage multiple knowledge-based credentials in a single tenant. And uh, we have a, an approach there and uh, we're beginning to work on the requirements tied to that. We've also made some updates to the eHoldings app um, uh, user experience as well. And uh, we also um, did some work in, in which uh, Dennis will talk about in a, in a minute or so related to access status types. So access status types will allow a library to manage at the package or title package level how they acquire access, um, how they, they achieved access to a package or a title package. Um, and so Dennis is gonna demo that as well as some of the work we've uh, done in uh, uh, adding custom fields to a user record. And so with that, I'm going to have Dennis take it away. Thank you, Karila. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, this is this one, yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to start off with uh, the access status types. Uh, it can be found uh, in the holding settings. So here we have um, a few created uh, examples of uh, my, those uh, might be. Mm, so let me create one. Another one, for example, and um, we can have uh, up to 15 uh, of uh, these access status types. And uh, now I'm going to show you where they can be applied. Um, so for example, 
when you create uh, a new package in eHoldings, uh, here you have an option uh, to select uh, an access status types uh, to be um, tied to this package. So for example, let's uh, choose EBA and um, something like that. Um, and here you can see the newly created package and uh, access the types uh, type uh, of uh, EBA. And uh, later you can edit this access type, change it to another one, save and close. And here you can see it's now um, changed to trial. Um, also, access the types can be uh, added to uh, titles in a package. So for example, let's choose this one and um, this title, for example. And uh, here you can see uh, it's not, it doesn't have an access status types. And if we edit it and select one, it will be updated to the subscribed. Um, yep, so uh, I believe um, it's all regarding the access status types. And um, now I'm going to switch to another feature, which is um, custom fields. Um, so custom fields um, can be found under settings of users app. Um, so here we are, and we can um, create a few. Uh, right now we have support uh, for three types of custom fields, um, which is text field, text area, and checkbox. Um, I'm going to create a text field, um, a custom field, for example, Facebook ID, and um, some help text. Um, so it has also a couple of options, which is uh, hidden. If it's uh, this one's checked, uh, then uh, Facebook ID custom field will not be shown in um, create, edit, or um, of users and required, which means it will be required to complete um, an edit or creation of a user record. Um, so let's change that to required, I guess. Um, save this one and uh, go to users. And um, here in the user custom fields, you can see that uh, there is now an option uh, Facebook ID and it's not set. So let's um, go and set it. Um, so uh, since it's required, it's now uh, required to input uh, something into this field. And if you click on this icon, you can see uh, the custom field description that uh, we've entered before. Um, so let's enter some data, um, save and close. And under custom fields, now uh, you can see Facebook ID is um, set correctly. Uh, also, um, custom fields can be edited uh, when you're creating a new user. So it's practically the same as in edit, um, but in create. Mm. I believe uh, that's all from my side. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. So, so if you make a custom field required, it mm -hmm. it won't um, mess up your existing users until um, you go and try to edit that particular user and then it's gonna make you fill it in. Is that right? Uh, yep, that's right. Um, so any user records that uh, were created before these, uh, this feature, it will have um, an empty uh, value. Thank you. Good stuff, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so Vega is next, starting off with Alex. Hi, uh, it's Roman, I'll start. Okay, go ahead, Roman. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it now? Yep, looks good. Okay, uh, the circulation rules editor used to allow non-existent policy names to be entered before. It uh, led to unexpected results in uh, circulation transactions. We usually get errors uh, during the checkout, which says that uh, an item uses non-existent policy. Uh, we implemented the validation that checks existing policies in the database and uh, doesn't allow to save 
uh, a rule with non-existent policy. Uh, so let's try to check how it works now. I have already prepared uh, a few policies. Uh, firstly, I'll try to uh, I'll try to save the rule uh, the loan uh, the rule with uh, unex non-existent uh, loan policy. For example, something like this. We got uh, the error message that uh, says uh, the policy L does not exist. Uh, let's return existing policy. It was uh, successfully saved. Uh, now I'm going to change a request policy to non-existent. Uh, the policy R does not exist. Mm, let's return existing policy. Uh, the next policy is not this policy. Uh, the policy N does not exist. The same for overdue fine policy. And uh, the same for item lost, uh, lost item fee uh, policy. Also the error message appears under the line uh, with a wrong rule. And uh, if we try to update another uh, rule, uh, for example, this one, Uh, the error message will be will be there. So that's all that I that I wanted to show uh, regarding uh, rule editor. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Roman. That's that was this is so very needed <laughs> for sure. That's great. All right, I guess Alex is next. Yep. Um, Roman, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yeah, sure. You're still sharing. I'm trying to stop it. <laughs> okay, well, the Roman is trying to stop sharing his screen. <laughs> um, I'm gonna tell you what my demo is gonna be about. So, <laughs> um, so I'm gonna show you some of the work Tim Vega has been uh, doing uh, on overdue fines. And there it is. Um, let me know when you see it. Yeah, we see it. Okay. So as the name suggests, an overdue fine is an automated fine issued when an item is returned late. And um, overdue fines and the rules um, according to which they're created or not are defined by overdue fine policies like this one I have here. As you can see, this policy uh, defines the size of an overdue fine, as well as the size of overdue recall fines. Those are fines um, for items that have been returned uh, after a recall request has been created for that item. And also it contains a few useful toggles that allow a more fine-grained control over and creation of overdue fines, like for example, the circumstances under which uh, an overdue fine should not be created even though uh, a loan is technically overdue. Um, also, uh, the way to use an overdue fine policy is uh, to include it in one of your uh, circulation rules like, like this one. 
makes use of this policy I've just showed you. And is the circulation rule for material type microform. Also, I should probably mention or define owners. Now, owners are entities authorized to collect over the fines. And for, say, manual fees fines, uh, those or owners are um, defined uh, from the beginning. But for automatic fines, like uh, an over the fine, those owners are determined dynamically. Um, namely, for an over the fine, the owner of this fine will be the owner of the service point and items effective location is assigned to. And uh, in this demo, I will use this owner, which uh, is the owner of CERC Desk 2. And I've created three loans. They are all uh, pretty much identical. They are all created for the same user, but obviously for different items. Uh, the only difference is that for item number three, there is a recall request created and that makes a difference. You will see in a minute. And also this page shows that this particular user doesn't have any open uh, fees or fines. So the first guy, case I want to show you is just regular check-in. And we're going to check in this item right here. Demo one. Nope, just a sec. Okay, this is interesting. Uh, it's possible this is related to some mod inventory trouble we're having on Snapshot at the moment. Yeah, probably because it's definitely worked just an hour ago. I, um, I've seen some issues too, just just half an hour ago on Snapshot. Um, okay, give me a second, I'll check. Yeah. Yeah, I believe this request is going to time out. If you've got a lot of stuff kind of in uh, prepared already in Snapshot, um, I don't think you can <laughs> replicate it. I believe that portfolio testing should be usable, but if you've you know put together a policy and a fine and stuff. Um, yeah, the problem is that it takes a fairly long time to set up uh, yeah. all the stuff I need. Yeah, and bad timing, unfortunately. Yeah, well, oh. it happens. <laughs> I guess. So let me just explain what was supposed to happen. Uh, briefly, uh, an order fine should be created um, during a regular check-in. Then another over the fine should have been created during a uh, loan renewal. And the third over the fine should have been created for an item uh, for which a recall request was created. And that's pretty much it, unfortunately, during now uh, because of some technical difficulties, I'm unable to show you all of this. Sorry about that. All right, no, thank you, Alex. Maybe we look next forward time. We're testing it next time, yeah, for sure. Okay, um, all right, so then um, next up is Concord with uh, Andre. Yep, hello, everyone. Hi. This is Andrzej Nowitzki from Concord. Uh, in the last two iterations, uh, Concord team put together all elements needed for exporting inventory instances with underlying mark records. I will demo exporting list of record identifiers and SQL queries from inventory search and then exporting uh, the instances in mark deep format. I want to emphasize that what I'm about to demo is a result of the work of the whole Concord team. Uh, also, core functional team work allow us removing some limitation from our prior, prior implementations and DevOps helped us with the reference environment setup. Please let me know if you see my screen. We do. Okay, wonderful. So let's go to the inventory and try to search uh, records with source, mark source and English language.
app can be found on 404 records. So let's save instance UIDs. And as you can see, the list contains of 404 uh, UIDs. Uh, thanks for the work done by core functional team. We were able to resolve the limitation of search records to be exported. Also, we can uh, save instances SQL query. And as you can see, this is a valid query. So let's go to the export application. I've got a prepared file with 120 UIDs, as you can see here. So we, we, we can start export <coughs> Uh, by selected a file with uh, identifiers of the record we want to export. You can browse or drag and drop file. Let's drop it, for example. When the job is running, you can uh, see it as a running job accordion, but since our file is small, uh, it goes straight to the uh, table with the completed jobs. And here it is. This is uh, the our file let's open it and as you can see this is a well formatted mark file and let's check the number of records here here yep 120 records are successfully exported and uh, the list of completed, uh, the table of completed job con contains uh, job IDs, profile, a number of records, uh, the date when the job completed and who ran it and the status. Also, let's try to export file with random generated UIDs that are now present in source record storage. storage. Yep, as you can see, the status of the job is fail and no records were exported. Uh, also, I want to mention that, that we created a project for API text for mo data export model and currently it covers half of our endpoints and we are planning to cover all our endpoints with such kind of tests. Uh, that is all what I have for today. Please let me know if you, if you have any questions. Thank you. Yay for export. So cool. Yeah. I'm, yeah, this is amazing. Could you explain um, what you do with this CQL queries when you export so, those? The uh, CQL uh, queries, this is Magda. Uh, um, the CQL queries will be used also as a way of uh, selecting the records for the export. It's not planned in Q2, but we will uh, use them uh, later. Ah, so, so uh, like right the... now, yes, right now you select the file with the UUIDs, uh, which define the set you want to export. But in the future, you will be able to provide the SQL query that will run against the data set. Oh, that's cool. So it's kind of like more dynamic. The SQL query will pick up whatever, whatever you know, matches, record, whatever yes. results there would be for that query exactly. at the time. Oh, so cool. All right. So, thank so you. So everything updated since a certain date mm -hmm. or something like that, Magda. <laughs> if, yes. So you can create the queries uh, as uh, Andre showed. Uh, uh, you can write the queries in um, query text box in inventory search, and you can use the query uh, CQL uh, query syntax or use the filters. You can also write the query that will. Um, um, select all the records that were added, updated uh, since the last export was run. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you everyone. And thank you Con Concord team for the great job. All right, and next is Core Functional, starting off with Sergey. Hi everyone, let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. I'd like to start with two small design improvements. And uh, the first one is in 
implemented in the check-in application. This is the display in the in-house use icon instead of placeholder in the column in-house use while uh, scanning the item. Uh, I'd like to remind that this icon appears only when the item is checked in at a service point assigned to its effective location. For example, if I uh, switch to another service point and uh, check this item in again, as you can see, there are no any icons in this field. Uh, the second uh, tiny improvement is in inventory application. And uh, it's related to display the effective uh, location item title in the location filter. Uh, since the effective location covers only item records and not, for example, holding records, it was decided to add the word item to the filter title in all three segments, here, here, and here as well. Uh, the next uh, thing I'd like to pre present is the ability to filter instance records by date created. Uh, in order to implement this functionality, the date range filter component from Folio Stripes library has been used. This component already has built-in validation. For example, we, can, we cannot enter a date that doesn't exist. For example, or we cannot confuse the date order. For example, as you can see, the error message appears below. Uh, and after entering the correct uh, date in in the uh, start date, for example, and in the uh, end date, for example, today's date, and after clicking apply button, then in the result pane, we get instance records whose creation date matches to the range of entry dates. For example, if I look into one of these records, we can see the record created at April 7th that uh, corresponds to the hour range of the dates. And the last thing for my de today demos, uh, for my demo is the effective, uh, effective call number stream in requests application. Uh, now, this string uh, is present not only in uh, a request detail page here, but also uh, but also on the request queue page. Here you are. You can see a single string as a value in the effective call number string field. Um, that's all from my side. Uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have no questions, I'm gonna pass the ball to my colleague and teammate, Michal. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Sergey. Sergey, I just let me just share my screen here. All right. Uh, so hi, hi everyone. I just have a couple couple small things to show you also uh, also in inside of the ui inventory um so the first thing i would like to show you is we we made some uh, adjustments to preceding and succeeding titles um so let me just 
edit one of the inventor, inventory um, records here. Um, what, what we had before, I just want to show you quickly what we had before was something which looked like this, where you could just enter folio ID for both proceeding and succeeding titles. Um, and we made, we made a couple adjustments um, to, to that uh, area. So as you can see, this looks a little bit different now and you are able to um, add not connected title to it by just typing. Um, Um, fr freely here in the text um, and also entering ISBN and ISN uh, by hand. Um, but you also have another option of um, connecting existing title by uh, hitting this little plus um, button here. And this will bring us our uh, select instance uh, plugin, which will allow you to choose one of the existing records. Um, for the connected titles, you can um, see that we create a link directly to that to that instance so i'm able to just click on it and it will it should take me um right to it uh, for not connected it will be just a free text um, and the very similar work has been has been done here for the succeeding titles let me just try to um not sure what happened to it let's refresh Sorry, it looks like folio testing maybe is also down now. I had to switch to um, folio testing because the snapshot was not um, behaving correctly, but it seems like maybe testing is also, also down. Let me try again here. Oh, so sorry. <laughs> try try this again. Again, we'll we'll add um, something which already exists to to um, to the preceding title. And as I mentioned, uh, similar. Um, Similar work has been done under succeeding titles, so this works in a very similar fashion. We are able to either type uh, something here or uh, choose an existing um, existing um, instance ID in order to connect it to this um, this um, instance record. And if I hit save and close, um, I should be able to see both preceding and succeeding titles uh, on the details screen. And again. Um, the connected titles will create a link so you can just directly go there from, from this screen. Um, so that's that's it from proceeding and succeeding titles. We also made a couple of adjustments to um, suppress from discover. We were having troubles with um, searching uh, by no here, just because the way the, the search query and SQL, SQL is kind of tricky here. So we, we had to make some adjustments on both server side and, and the front end to, to generate the correct query. But as you can see now, it's, it's performing uh, well and we are finally able to find uh, the correct data. It, this work has been done on both holdings and items um, segments. So this also should work here. Um, and that's, that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michal. Looks great. Uh, okay, so then, um, yeah, that's it for the demos. So now we'll move on to Anton to hear a QA update. Um, sorry, Kate. Did this I miss Alex. one? No, uh, this is Alex from Vega. I think uh, inventory on Snapshot is back online. So. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, I go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Can you see it? Yep. Okay, let me just check. Okay, yeah, it's working. Um, so I'm gonna check in three of these items and we'll see if the order defined is created for each one of them. 
So the first one is demo one. This is just a regular check-in. And this one didn't work. Come on. Let's uh, try this one. We'll try to renew it. Okay. Yeah, as you can see, there's an overdefined created for this item. Three and um, the third one is demo three. This is the one created for, with um, uh, recall request. So as you can see, this, yeah, overdue recall fine is, um, uh, the size of the fine is smaller than for regular overdue fine. This one says it's one unit of currency per hour. This one is one per day. So uh, the overdue fine for this one should be much smaller. So let's try this one. Yep. See, it's waiting pickup by the requester and Yeah, there's a second over define. And that's probably it. Um, sorry for the first item uh, not producing an over define. I guess I created it incorrectly. But it works, tested multiple times. <laughs> uh, that's it. That's all I Great. got. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks for making that work. Um, Okay. All right. So Anton, are you ready? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, that's not what I meant. I meant this. All right. So the usual uh, update on the coverage uh, with uh, as guys mentioned they fixed the bug for the coverage of ui inventory it shows coverage again unfortunately we lost coverage for ui users so there's still um, memory leak problems uh, within the uh, uh, within tests so uh, they will be working to figure out how to bring UI users back online. We got extra, uh, we got coverage for UI search reported recently. So we have 54%. So it's a good progress compared to having nothing. And everything else is pretty much status quo, uh, quote, uh, or uh, marginal improvements. So just again, guys, encourage you to maintain don't let coverage slip and just um, keep it growing. So now on to the bug fest. So I didn't talk to development um, community to, about bug fest. It's almost over. The, um, the testing by uh, volunteers is done. And we are, uh, as most of you, um, Painful, uh, some of you painfully aware that we have a punch list of issues to go through and that's what we did last week and this week and week before that we, um, we tested and so you can see uh, 705 test cases out of 799 passed so it's a pretty good percentage uh, and the current bug fest is on the left hand side and previous one is on the right hand side so we have more test cases this time and we have fewer test cases failed this time so overall it's um, um, if you look at the pie chart it's better results than uh, than previous ones so we're progressing in a good direction uh, 
we have fewer bugs to fail this time uh, and percentage wise uh, we have more bugs that block but these numbers will change because we still have to verify um, verify uh, uh, verify defects that's being worked on right now and being actively released right now so um, this is participation table so we had 35 volunteers from the um, community uh, and uh, they completed 575 tests uh, and 224 tests were completed by the folio full staff so it's myself uh, and product owners so product owners picked up a lot of work this time because a lot of things, um, a lot of test cases were created um, uh, uh, at, uh, during the last week. And then we were not able to get it out to the community testers in time. Uh, this is uh, participation uh, for the past three bug fest for um, by organization. So the green color is, um, are the uh, universities or libraries from Germany. So you can see they're very active and the white uh, color are uh, mostly uh, organizations based in US. And most of these organizations are the ones that will be going live in, or in the near future or already live like Chalmers. But I believe that Alabama, uh, Missouri, five colleges, um, they all planning to go live this summer. So this is why they are active at the moment. So now the, uh, if you're interested how your team is doing, you can go to the Buckfest dashboard um, and um, uh, check out what's going on. So, I think at this point, it's this, uh, we, we had 99 defects filed for this bug fest. Uh, so it's higher than usual. Usually we're about 80. So we like 20, bug, uh, 20 bucks higher than normal or average. And pretty high number of P1s and P2s that made more than 50% of the bugs that were filed. Uh, and this is the widget that's also present on the um, on the Bugfest dashboard that shows how many bugs we need to fix before release uh, can be blessed or approved for GA. So at this, so we had 110 bugs uh, flagged must uh, as must have for this release. 89 of them fixed and only 90, um, what do we have here, uh, uh, 21. 21 bug is still needs to be uh, closed and after that we have to verify it in the bug fest. So with the rate that we're going now and with our frequency of updates to the bug fest uh, system, we update twice a day so if you release module in the at night of the US Eastern time, so during your normal working hours um, in Eastern Europe, for, uh, then it will be deployed in the morning, so your afternoon. Then if something is uh, being released during the uh, um, working hours in uh, US time, it will be um, deployed around 4 p.m. Eastern time. So we deploy twice a day and to give uh, product owners uh, ability to verify as many defects as and close as many defects as possible uh, every day. But we still have 21 at outstanding. And I believe, um, yeah, I believe this is all I have um, for today. Are there any questions? Oh, I guess not. I guess, I guess not. Sold. <laughs>
All right. Thank you, Anton. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Um, where is the deck? So we have just two standard sprints coming up. Um, so sprints 86 kicked off on Monday, two week sprint and sprint 87 after that. And we will have our next sprint review after those two sprints. And if you're interested, you can see what the teams have planned um, for the next couple of sprints here in the plans slides. And that's all we had for today. Are there any questions or comments before we break? All right, then I think we can end seven minutes early today. Thank you so much, everyone um, who demoed and, and everyone, everyone else for being here. Thank Have a good guys. one.